and then we can look at the cranial nerve tests. Now, there is a test for each cranial nerve. We generally don't worry too much about them. For example, the olfactory nerve, we could do it by having them smell soap. Block one nostril, ask them if they can smell. But as most people are walking around with upper respiratory tract infections and blocked up noses, this tends to be a little counterproductive. Um, we can look for the optic, optic nerve. And one way to do that is with a confrontation test where we try to determine whether or not the patient has um, hemianopia. So we're looking for scotomas here. Uh, the confrontation test is this. You bring the patient up so that your eyes and their eyes are level. You need a couple of pieces of white tissue or ping pong balls or something that's obviously white. And basically you set yourself up so that um, there's a reasonable difference, distance between you but you're not too far away. Because we're going to bring our hands between the two of us so that you as the operator can just about see the tissue in the periphery of your vision. Now this means that you've got to have good vision. And you ask the patient if they can see both sides while they look straight into your eyes. Can yes. you? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you simply move them around the periphery and ask them if they can continue seeing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you find that you can see it but they can't see it, can you see it now? Mm -hmm. Then they're in trouble. If they can see it and you can't see it, you're in trouble. And I'm a little bit in trouble here. I can't see quite up that high. And we just cover the whole of the periphery. And this way you can map out, for example, if she couldn't see it up in this area, then she would have lost this quadrant of vision and she would have hemianopia over there. We can also look, to see, look at pupil dilatation and constriction. Now, you can use a flashlight if you've got one. Um, generally speaking, I haven't got one. So we can do a consensual reflex by closing up one eye and observing the other pupil. When I take this hand away, this pupil will constrict and the other pupil will constrict reflexively with it. And that's what I look for. And there it goes. And you just compare both sides. Like so. And this is a consensual pupil reflex, so you really don't need a flashlight particularly. You can also produce uh, pupil constriction by having them follow your hand in, and as they bring their eyes together, the pupils constrict to sharpen the focus. It's not quite as um, easy as the other test, particularly in bright lights like this, because he's already quite constricted. Okay, uh, we can test the trochlea, the abducens, and the... Um, ocular motor nuclei by the fixation test. And essentially what you do here is you have them follow your finger with their eyes. And you're looking for the reproduction of nystagmus, paralysis, and a general inability not to follow your finger with one or usually uh, with both eyes or usually one eye. Looking at that, if you've lost one of these, you've lost either the th third, fourth, or sixth a nuclear, at least they're not functioning properly. And with a bit of um, study of neuroanatomy, you can basically tell which one it is. Um, but uh, again, that's covered in the manual. Okay, the trigeminal nerve we can do with sensory testing. Now, light touch is probably the best. And when you test this, try to test bilaterally and keep the testing close into the midline of the face. Out here, we've got overlap from the neck. So the closer in we can keep this, the more it's trigeminal. Remembering that we have the mandibular, uh, maxillary, and ophthalmic branches through here. So we just follow through and you say, do they both feel the same? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, the tendon reflex for this is the jaw jerk. Um, the problem with this is, unless it's very obviously hyper, you've got nothing else to compare it to. So, you really can't pick up the marginal ones. Just relax for me, open your mouth, there you go. And just tap your finger and feel for the reflex to kick your finger up. And depending on whether you've got an upper or motor neuron lesion, this will give you either hyporeflexia or hyperreflexia. We're obviously interested in upper motor neuron um, lesions in the brainstem, so we're looking for hyperreflexia with some cl clonus. But as I say, it's not the easiest one to assess because you've got nothing to compare it with. Okay, the facial nerve, the seventh nucleus, um, smile and frown.
<laughs> and essentially, if they can do both of those things, you can be fairly assured that the facial nerve is okay. The vestibulocochlear system, um, we can test the vestibular system by sitting the patient up and lying them down, and we can look for deafness for the cochlea. So let's look at the cochleal system first. Can you lie on your back for me? Okay, what I'm going to do here is I've got to establish first whether she's hearing symmetrically. Um, and the easiest way to do that is just with your fingers doing this. And you have them an equal distance apart and you ask them if they can hear that in both ears equally. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the problems I have is I can do this easier with this hand than this hand. So this one tends to be a little louder. If there's a difference, then just switch your hands across and do that with it. Okay, and just make sure it's not you and it is the patient. Now, let's assume that she said that she can't hear as well in the left ear as she can in the right. I need to know whether we're looking at conduction deafness or sensorineural deafness. We can do um, an air conduction, bone conduction test here. Now, you can use tuning forks, and we've got Weber's and Ryan's tests for that, but they're actually not necessary. What I'll do is I'll close her ears up and ask her to hum and ask her to figure out which ear she can hear the humming in best. Now, before I actually close her ears up, I'll tell her to hum before I do this, otherwise she's deaf. So, I'm going to close your ears. When I tap your face, start humming for me. And I want you to tell me if you can hear it in both ears equally or if one ear more than the other, okay? Mm, same. Okay. Now, if we assume that she was less, um, or she was deafer on the left side than the right side, if she heard that humming in the left ear, that would be conduction deafness. If she couldn't hear it in the left ear at all and only on the right, that's sensorineural. And that's obviously the one that we're concerned with. Now that may be simply um, related to age changes or previous damage. Um, but if this has been associated with the trauma, that is they can hear less well after the trauma, then it becomes significant. Okay, for the vestibular system, um, we can do sitting up and laying down. So we'll stabilize the neck and the head, and we'll get the patient to sit up rapidly and see what effect we have. When I count to three, I want you to sit up as quickly as you can. One, two, three. So I fix the head and the neck. So I'm not allowing this to move so there's no effect from the cervical joints or the artery. Okay? And I asked her if she's dizzy. If she had been dizzy, this could have been due to hypoten hypotension. So I want to lay her down, and that can't be due to um, hypotension now. So again, I'll stabilize the head and the neck. When I count to three, lay down quickly. One, two, three. So if that made her dizzy on the way down, then I would assume that this is vestibular. Okay. Um, all right, now we can move on. The Ninth nerve is generally not tested. The tenth nerve um, is the, which one is it? I've forgotten. Hypoglossal. We won't test that. We'll test the accessory nerve. And we'll test this with resisted elevation of the shoulders. Don't let me move you. Good. And or resisted rotation of the head. Don't let me move you. Okay, and any weakness here is significant. They should not be weak. They're, they're, a disc lesion or a joint problem in the neck will not weaken these muscles. This is the accessory nerve. And for the 12th nerve, we'll simply have the patient poke their tongue out so they protrude. And if it's weak on one side, it will deviate towards that side. All of these tests are quite innocuous tests. Um, and they really don't disturb the vertebro-basilar system at all.